there, and welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Molly. What do you know about radioisotope power systems? Not even sure what an RPS is? Well, you may have heard of the Voyager mission to the outer planets or the ongoing Cassini mission to Saturn. And we can't leave out New Horizons, the NASA spacecraft that is speeding on its way to Pluto. All of these amazing NASA missions to explore the solar system have been made possible by the use of radioisotope power systems, or RPS for short. An RPS is a unique power system that provides electricity using heat from the natural decay of the radioisotope plutonium-238. Radioisotope power can significantly enhance the ability of solar system exploration missions to meet their scientific and operational goals. Usually these power systems enable space missions to happen that just wouldn't work without them. In particular, an RPS provides a continuous, long-lived power source that's ideal for missions to places that are dark, dusty, or have extreme temperature fluctuations where solar panels or batteries alone might not be the best choice. Well, the radioisotope power system technology allows us to go to the furthest reaches of the solar system as well as other places in the solar system where the sun's energy just can't be used for spacecraft power. So we want to bring a different energy source with us. So out in the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune range, you would want to use radioisotope power. So knowing that, you may not be surprised that we've been using this technology to power space probes for 50 years. Spacecraft that are powered by radioisotope power systems have been an integral part of our exploration since the very beginning. And this is because they provide such steady and reliable power over the course of an entire mission, which can go beyond 30 years. We like to send spacecraft with radioactive power systems into the places of the solar system where there's very low light. We, we want to go far away from the sun. The sunlight is going to get dimmer and dimmer. It's just like when you leave your house at night and you see your porch light and it gets dimmer and dimmer as you drive away. That's just how it is as the spacecraft takes off towards Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So we need radioisotope power systems to provide a reliable, steady source of heat that we then convert into electricity that provides the power for these missions as they go on their outward journey across the solar system. The power source for an RPS produces heat for a long time. That means an RPS can provide power for long-lasting space missions like the Voyager spacecraft. Launched back in 1977, the two Voyagers are the longest continually operating spacecraft in deep space. After traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour for more than 30 years, they've actually reached, well, basically, the edge of our solar system. Both craft are still sending back data as they hurtle towards interstellar space, the space between the stars. These spacecraft really have gone where no one has gone before. And right now, they're helping us learn more about the edges of our solar system. NASA ground controllers recently commanded one of the Voyagers to rotate in space for the first time in 20 years to make a certain kind of scientific measurement. And the spacecraft responded perfectly. The reason they still have power is thanks to RPS technology. Try finding a battery that'll hold a charge after three years of use, let alone three decades. Voyager 1 and 2 are not the first spacecraft to use RPS technology, nor are they the last. More than 20 NASA missions have used this technology. Pioneer 10 used an RPS to fly through the asteroid belt, making our first direct observations of Jupiter. And Galileo gave us our first close-up rendezvous with an asteroid and was nearby taking pictures when a comet smashed into Jupiter. The Ulysses mission flew over the sun's poles to help us learn more about solar flares. Even the Apollo astronauts used RPS technology to power science experiments they'd left behind on the surface of the moon. At Saturn, the Cassini mission also makes use of RPS. At Saturn's distance from the sun, which is 10 times farther away than Earth, solar power isn't a practical option, at least not yet. But thanks to RPS technology, we can continue to receive amazing images like these. Cassini's incredibly successful mission has been extended twice and it still has power to explore. It will have operated in space for 20 years by the time the mission ends in 2017. There's another benefit to using RPS. Some of the excess heat from the power system can be used to keep vital parts of a spacecraft warm so they can operate in cold places like deep space or the frigid surface of Mars. 
Of course, NASA wants to use the best power system for any mission it launches, and safety is the first of NASA's core values. Radioisotope power systems are a type of nuclear technology, so how safe are they? Safety is a key factor in the design of all radioisotope power systems. We design safety from the inside out and the outside in of all radioisotope power systems. We begin with the radioisotope fuel itself, plutonium-238 dioxide, which is a ceramic material. It's insoluble and breaks into large pieces when impacted. Next, we have the iridium cladding, which surrounds the plutonium fuel. The iridium has, is ductile, it's very strong, and it has a high melting temperature. Surrounding the iridium is a carbon material. It's very tough, and it also protects against fires and the heat of re-entry. Department of Energy and its predecessor agencies have been involved with for over 50 years in developing space RPS with NASA, Navy, Air Force. Combining technology with know-how, and the result is an RPS that makes power using the heat from its plutonium fuel source, works in all kinds of extreme environments, and lasts a really long time. And for some of NASA's most popular and exciting space missions, RPS technology has been and remains an absolute necessity. I think the future for us is very bright, very interesting. We have a lot of places to go in the solar system. We need to bring radioactive power systems along to be able to go understand the ice surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. We'd like to go out to the icy moon of Saturn that's known as Enceladus. We would think that it would be a frozen ball of ice, but we find it's actually geologically active and there's water and volatile spewing out of its south pole. Also out at Saturn is the giant moon Titan, which has a hazy atmosphere and liquid hydrocarbon lakes. We'd like to send a spacecraft there. And then as we travel even further out, we come to the Kuiper Belt, where there's a myriad of small bodies that are very primitive, leftover building blocks from the formation of the solar system. Some past NASA missions would not have been the success they were without the use of RPS. In fact, without it, we wouldn't have had this revealing picture of Mars' surface in 1976, or this panoramic view from the far side of Saturn, or even this glimpse of Earth from 4 billion miles away or any of these dozens of images, we wouldn't have any of these without RPS. So, radioisotope power systems lead to another kind of RPS, really productive spacecraft. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. I'm Molly, and I'll catch you next time on NASA Launchpad.